going to be a piece written by a 37-year-old adult about a platform that's dominated by people under 25. So I want to say up front that it's going to be a little cringe. Chuggy, even. But hopefully it'll be at least a little enlightening. It's also meant to be more of a guide for people who haven't messed with TikTok at all. Longtime TikTok users may get some enjoyment out of it, but really this is my explainer to the uninitiated, the hows and whys of the platform. Also, just to get this out of the way now, I'm not really going to get into the TikTok data security and privacy stuff, mostly because I've yet to find anyone who can identify the ways that TikTok is an evil data sponge in ways that, say, Facebook and Twitter aren't. I'm not saying TikTok is unproblematic on that front. Most of this video is critical of TikTok as a platform. I'm saying that breaking down the exact nature of the data TikTok captures and how or whether it's more dangerous or more invasive than any other social media app would require finding extremely technical sources that I also trust not to say anything it grabs as evil because something something China something something Tencent. For now, just assume that, like every other social media platform in the world, it asks for more than it should and takes even more than that. And if privacy is a big concern for you, maybe don't use this app. Or Facebook. Or Twitter. Or Snapchat or LinkedIn or Instagram. Do keep using YouTube though, because I like money. But why talk about TikTok at all? Well, I fell into the TikTok content hole at the start of the pandemic. Once Tiger King and Doom Eternal and Animal Crossing had been consumed, stuff more or less stopped coming out. Movies were indefinitely delayed, TV shows put off production, plays and concerts were cancelled, sports seasons were scuttled, and even new music stopped coming out, which is one of the reasons The Weeknd's Blinding Lights was able to stay on the Billboard charts for so long. Culture just kind of froze. But then there was TikTok. Because it's a social media platform whose content is mostly made by individuals at home, it didn't really suffer the same fate. In a drought of anything to do or watch, it offered a seemingly endless well of new content, from jokes and skits to new songs to parasocial personalities, all available in bite-sized chunks one after the other. In a world where everything else had ground to a halt, it felt like one of the few places where life was still happening. And having spent the better part of two years exploring the platform, I've come to understand a lot of its idiosyncrasies and problems. But when I try to bring TikTok up to other grown adults, I tend to get weird stares. It's a major social media platform and a major driver of culture, but it seems to be anathema to a lot of people over 30 or so. So I thought it might be useful to shine some light on a platform that some people seem to view as too alienating or too youthful to engage with. What it is, what it does well, and where it might have its own unique problems. The short answer of what the heck is TikTok is that it's a platform designed to facilitate the creation and sharing of short form videos that typically range from a few seconds to a few minutes long. But you probably already knew that. The long answer takes us all the way back to 2012. TikTok's owners, ByteDance, released a string of mobile apps in hopes of finding one that would resonate with the public, allowing them to build a user base from which they could construct a platform. A lot of these apps were mostly single-use gimmick applications, like Hilarious Goofy Pics and Real Beauties Every Day A Hundred Beautiful Girls. Eventually, however, they stumbled on their first really successful app, Taoqiao. And I apologize in advance for my pronunciation of Chinese names here. Taoqiao was a news headline application that launched in August of 2012, and it was built on a pretty simple idea. People want to see news articles, op-eds, blog posts, and more relevant to their interests. But instead of opting into topics the way you would by, say, subscribing to a subreddit on Reddit or following a trusted news account on Twitter or Facebook, Taoqiao would algorithmically generate a list of content for you based on numerous factors. This included not just the subjects of the articles that a user clicked on, but how long they spent reading them, whether the user clicked the like button on the recommendation or left a comment, and even where users read certain types of articles. Did you read the sports on the subway home? Did you prefer to look at business headlines at work? The more a user engaged with the application, the more the application would know about them and the better its recommendations would become. A year later, in 2013, and unrelated to ByteDance, Twitter released its ill-fated Vine platform, where users could host six-second videos. In short order, it became something of a cultural touchstone, giving us such classics as... Look at all those chickens! And... Get to Del Taco! They got a new thing called Frisha... Free... Free Shavakadu! Instagram added support for short 15 second videos a few months later, and it became apparent that short form video was becoming something of a thing. But there was never any real central app for it. 
Twitter never figured out how to monetize or integrate Vine into its core services and shuttered it in 2016. And while Instagram has had support for video content for almost a decade now, it's remained primarily a photo sharing site until recently when it's decided to become, well, TikTok. Meanwhile, lots of short-form video applications sprung up in the mid-2010s, but most of them were either not designed to be media platforms, like Snapchat, which was more of a messaging service that utilized short videos, or they were gimmicky applications like the lip-syncing app Dubsmash. Dubsmash is a smartphone app that lets you lip-sync over audio of your favorite songs, Everybody wants to be a cat. films, speeches, or quotes. You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off! Among the gimmick short video apps was one called Musical.ly, or Musical.ly. It was a clone of the French application Mindy, where users could pick song samples that were pulled from iTunes' library of 30-second previews to serve as the background track for video content. This is effectively the core of where TikTok's reputation as that app where kids do dances starts. Kids, and it should be noted that the demographic using Musical.ly really was mostly like kid kids in middle school, would take the clip from a new or popular song, come up with a series of dance moves for it, and kick it around as a challenge for others to take on. Musical.ly was a fun app with a minimal barrier of entry for content creation, which led to it being quite popular. You just picked a song and did a dance. But it also struggled to grow beyond that initial concept. It was a place where kids could watch other kids do dance videos, or make dance videos of their own, but there really wasn't much else beyond that. And even if there were someone uploading something else, it wouldn't be easy for people to find it. Musical.ly was structured as a social network. You could see your friends' videos and a handful of officially hand-curated featured videos, but it wasn't a place you just went to watch short videos in general. It was a place where you shared your dance videos. Then in 2016, ByteDance, having grown tremendously with the massive success of the Taochiao News and Article Recommendation app, decided they wanted to get in on the emerging video content market. They released three apps that were clones of popular existing apps, one that was a copy of YouTube, one that copied China's then-current short-form video leader Guizhou, and one that copied Musical.ly named Awesome.me, or A.me for short. And here, finally, we have the application that was to become TikTok. A.me managed to combine Musical.ly's approach to accessible content creation that used pop songs as backing tracks for video content with ByteDance's experience with algorithmic recommendation engines from its work on the headline application Taochao. This is what set A.me apart from Musical.ly. Not only could it facilitate content creation, but it would find content relevant to you automatically based on your preferences and viewing habits. It was a place to consume content as much as it was a place to make and share content, and that allowed it to grow much more quickly and retain users for longer. A.me would eventually be redubbed as Douyin in China and released as TikTok globally in 2017. And in five short years, it has grown to be one of the most downloaded apps at any given time. And with that explosive growth, the platform has grown far beyond just dance videos, though those certainly still exist. There is no chronological feed on TikTok. This is because, as noted, TikTok isn't really a social media site. It's a content delivery platform. You can go to an individual person's page and see their previous videos in the order they posted them, but unless you're checking out a user before you follow them, no one really uses the platform like that. Instead, like Taotiao before it, TikTok uses a personalized algorithm to deliver users content best suited to them. This is colloquially referred to as the For You page, an endless stream of videos curated to suit your needs and interests, or at least your needs and interests as the TikTok algorithm understands them. When you first start using TikTok, you'll likely only get generically popular videos, dance crazes, silly cat videos, or random TikToks from popular creators. Broad, generic stuff with hundreds of thousands or millions of likes, with only a few smaller videos sprinkled in to sort of test the waters of your interest. As you interact with the site and like, share, comment, subscribe, or even just watch specific videos all the way through instead of scrolling past them, TikTok will slowly build out a profile of the kinds of content you want to watch, or at least the kinds of content you're likely to engage with. These kinds of content start being experienced pretty quickly. While there's no formal tagging system visible to the end user to say, hey, you're seeing this video about comic book characters because you liked that skit about Spider-Man and Doctor Strange two days ago, you can definitely notice the sorts of videos the algorithm kicks your way and start to see the shape of topics recommended to you. This results in there being what are called sides of TikTok. 
the amorphous groupings of content that the algorithm tends to lump together, so noticeable that people have jokingly made maps of it. All right, when you first sign up for TikTok, you're going to be put on Dancing TikTok and Teenage Thirst Trap TikTok. These are your two main sections of TikTok. Now, from Dancing TikTok, you can go the artsy way and hit Resin TikTok. You can go to the Can't Dance TikTok or it'll send you over here to Gay TikTok, which is where you get the best, like, skits and stuff. A lot of the time, these are very broad, popular categories. Comic book talk, or Star Wars TikTok, or whatever. But they can also get pretty specific. I have, for example, ended up on Lego Collector TikTok, or Haunted House TikTok, or Roller Coaster Fandom TikTok. These are smaller, niche subjects with fewer creators and fewer videos, so the fact that the algorithm would keep serving them up to me tells me that I have arrived at that side of TikTok, that the algorithm has associated my account with that kind of content. But no algorithm is perfect, and you or your content can also end up on the wrong side of TikTok. Because you don't control how your account or content gets categorized, it's possible for an association to be made that isn't really there or isn't really desired. This is only a moderate pain for content viewers. For example, if you like a video because it's got a funny gag, TikTok may come to the conclusion that you like it because of its creator or subject matter. I liked, like, two TikToks making fun of the Dear Evan Hansen movie and ended up on Broadway TikTok for, like, a month. And no hate to Broadway TikTok, but I live in North Carolina. I do not care about the drama surrounding Hugh Jackman's run on The Music Man. Not gonna see it, might be great, might suck, don't know, don't care. But the wrong side of TikTok thing poses much more danger for content creators. Like, if TikTok thinks I'm real into Broadway and then it just shows me a bunch of videos I can flip past about Broadway, no big deal. But if one of my videos gets associated with a concept or type of viewer incorrectly, it's entirely possible for it to be slotted in front of the wrong audience en masse. And the internet is a pretty unfun place when your audience is actively hostile. Take these TikToks by this teacher, for example. Go look at my last video in the comment section, you guys. I don't even know. I don't even know. Face mask on. Get your moves on. Face mask on. Get your moves on. And the comments here are just full of rancid anger and the dumbest takes possible. And it's not just comments. We'll dive into this more in a bit, but TikTok is all about creating TikTok content from TikTok content, meaning that you'll be getting call-out videos and stitches and more. TikTok's algorithm is all about delivering content a given user would want to watch, but not about ensuring that creators get the audience they want or expect or find safe. Hi, hi, hi. Can you stop scrolling? I'm on the wrong side of TikTok, so if you're not a creepy old man that thinks my bosoms are beautiful, can you interact with this video? Because it's really scary here. Meanwhile, this is a minor point, but the algorithm, combined with TikTok's low barrier to entry for content creation, also makes the platform extremely susceptible to spoilers. Like, it's a good idea to stay off of social media in general if there's a new episode of your favorite show out that you haven't caught yet. But you can mute words in Twitter, and YouTube doesn't really tend to spoil things you don't choose to watch videos about. Except for Screen Rant, who have just decided to start putting spoilers in their thumbnails, and YouTube auto-recommends them to me, which... whatever. But even then, somebody had to write a script and edit together a whole video of bad fan theories or whatever. It's still bad, but it probably hits a day or two later, not immediately. TikTok just requires that someone grab their phone and say, Just found out that they beheaded Ned Stark. Damn. That sucks. Or whatever, and now it's out there, circulating 10 seconds after the episode airs. And you're likely to run into it because you already like Game of Thrones content. You're on Game of Thrones talk, the Game of Thrones side of TikTok. And this is Game of Thrones content. You are likely to find it. It is likely to be presented to you. And we could have a conversation about the toxic nature of spoiler culture, and we probably should, but it's still kind of crappy to discover the latest plot beats of every show you like before you even get a chance to watch them, and TikTok is designed specifically to spread that kind of material. And this isn't helped by there being a small cottage industry of accounts that just recap movies and TV shows in abridged form to farm views. Edith has caught Thomas making love to his own sister, Lucille, as he did every night since the day of their marriage. And entire channels that just straight up post TV episodes piecemeal. More importantly, the For You page intentionally avoids putting dates on the videos it shows you. Dates only become revealed by going to the account's list of videos, finding the one you just watched, and clicking on it to reveal the date. 
This is done because it keeps the For You page feeling perpetually immediate. Everything you're seeing is of the nebulous now. In reality, the dates the algorithm can pull from, while weighted towards the past day or two, can actually be weeks or even months back. It lets them draw from a much wider potential source of videos while focusing on keeping your engagement up. Something doesn't need to actually be happening right now, just in the past little while, as long as it lines up with your interests and algorithmic profile to keep you scrolling and keep you engaged. You don't mind if that cat video is from last week, do you? It's new to you, so it might as well have been posted now. But this time ambiguity is actually a major problem for, say, news TikTokers, who have to specify in each post, either visually or verbally, what date they're making the report on, since people can stumble onto it a few or even several days later when it's not really news. It's Wednesday night, and here's what happened. This is an update for Friday around noon Eastern time, and that window is getting even smaller. So now the prediction is crash landing around 2.26 Eastern time p.m. Saturday. It also enables the spread of misinformation on busy news days. A major event might happen, and a false report or rumor might get out, and then an hour later get corrected by authorities. All right, everybody, the rocket has crash landed. It's been spotted high in the atmosphere in multiple locations over in Malaysia, like here in Bentalu and here in Kuching. And three hours after that, you might boot up TikTok for the first time in the day and see the viral rumor on your For You page, but not the subsequent correction, and then walk away with bad info. It's now expected to crash down around 1.24 p.m. Eastern time, plus or minus one hour right around here. Remember, the rocket could come down anywhere along this path. They have narrowed it down to just one orbit. The effort to present an endless stream of immediate content, or the illusion thereof, squishes things together but removes critical context. Comedy skits are followed by rants about Marvel Comics, and those are followed by sob stories about a dog that can't get adopted. It's all just a fire hose of content which means it's real easy to lose grasp of the thing you're actually looking at in that moment and where it sits in context. Like, you know how in the early 2000s, boomers had a hard time understanding that The Onion was a satirical news site and would complain on Facebook about the $8 billion abortion plex? Well, now millennials and Gen Z can get a taste of that. The Onion's TikToks are laid right in between your friends' TikToks and actual news organizations, so it might take you a second to realize, oh wait, this is bullshit. Dog days are coming to Walt Disney World in 2023. Guests will be able to bring their furry friends to the park with them. This is a special ticketed event, which will be $50 per pup per park. You'll be able to bring your dog with you on some attractions, while other attractions you'll need to do a ride swap. And while it's funny satire when The Onion or some other publication weaponizes TikTok's passive consumption, it feels a little more disingenuous and manipulative when a sponsored ad does the same thing. Presenting itself as just regular TikTok content before you realize it's an ad. Hey! That's the stupidest thing I've ever- Probably go thick ketchup. <laughs> the choice to tie TikTok's content to an algorithmic curation system is what gives the platform its power. It is a place of endless content catered specifically to your interests. But that endless stream of content has a cost, of exposing viewers to videos they'd rather not see, and of exposing creators to audiences they'd rather not have the attention of. It also removes context, temporal context, or satirical context, or, hey, the show's only been out for three hours and I haven't even gotten a coffee yet, can you chill with the spoilers context. It is an infinite stream of best guesses to match you with stuff, and if it guesses wrong and causes some damage along the way, oh well, a robot did it. Nobody's accountable. And the fact that this is the system that so many social platforms are looking to head towards should be met with a fairly heavy degree of skepticism. Creators no longer control audiences, and audiences no longer control what they see. So, as YouTube viewers used to two-hour video essays, you may be asking, what does the actual content on this short-form video platform look like? How do you do anything in 30 seconds to three minutes? So let's take a look at it. Well, for one thing, the platform's aspect ratio is nine by 16, exclusively. This has some serious implications for the kind of content that shows up because it becomes difficult to make TikToks using footage from more traditional media. If you want to, say, show a TV show clip, you end up either having to have a teeny little screen and room to put some other crap around it, like a video game, a slightly larger zoomed-in screen that crops the edges off and still isn't really full screen, or you can flip it horizontal, but the app doesn't support landscape mode, so almost nobody does that. 
This is one of the reasons I've struggled to figure out how to make content for the platform. TikTok is not really a place to show gameplay or film footage because it simply can't render them well. The 9 by 16 aspect ratio is perfect for people, though. It easily fits a head and most of the upper body in the frame, allowing you to see not only the person speaking, but their body language. So content on the platform tends to be much more people-focused, full of individuals speaking into the camera, a sea of talking heads. Another uniquely defining aspect of TikToks is their length. The time limit on videos was 15 seconds at launch, then 60 seconds, and in July of 2021 they bumped it up to 3 minutes, and as of March in 2022, TikToks by some users could be as long as 10 minutes long. But while the extra runtime may be useful in specific scenarios, not many TikToks approach the 3 minute length, let alone the 10 minute length. It is very much a platform of short videos, and that's amplified by the algorithm. It's better to release 10 short videos that you didn't put a lot of work into and hope that one finds traction than spend a lot of time on one very high quality thing because if it doesn't take off, that's just time wasted. Like, I can promote this YouTube video on Twitter or Facebook, but it's much harder to promote a specific TikTok because embedding TikToks outside of the platform is janky and largely unsupported, and inside the platform it's all up to the almighty algorithm. So content tends towards the quick and off the cuff, the unscripted, minimal production value. Not for everything, but for most things. A person talking into a cell phone. Short video length also means that, much like on Twitter, you don't tend to get particularly well-researched or nuanced opinions. Like there was recently a piece on Kotaku about the Orientalism inherent in Stray and Cyberpunk writ large, and how it's a legacy the entire genre has inherited and struggled with from Blade Runner to Cyberpunk 2077. And this gets repackaged on TikTok as... This is the new face of racism. Yes, there are really people out there calling the cyberpunk cat game Stray racist. Yeah, no one's calling the cat racist. Whatever. It, the point is that it's not exactly a platform of reasoned debate. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the videos are just so short. They need to capture your attention and move on. Sound design also plays a huge part. The ability to use music as a backing track that started all the way back with Musical.ly was modified so that users could upload their own sounds or make the audio of their video a sound that could be chosen by others. And the result is one of the few platforms that really uses audio mimetically since, I don't know, the days of YTMND? You're the man now, dog. You're the man now, dog. So to pick a hugely popular example, Stranger Things 4 comes out and has a scene with this in it. Wake up, Chrissy! Chrissy, wake up! I don't like this, Chrissy, wake up! And then user at Shmoyoho uses that to create a catchy auto-tuned song. Chrissy, wake up! I don't like this! Chrissy, wake up! Hey, hello? And from there, people use that audio to express existential dread at the world around them. Chrissy, wake up! I don't like this! Chrissy, wake up! Chrissy, wake up! I don't like this! Chrissy, wake up! Hey, hello? Meanwhile, others take the auto-tuned version of the song, which has since become a meme, and make their own version of the audio, further remixing it. Chrissy, wake up! Then people take those audios and further recontextualize the song in new ways. Now, memes pop up everywhere every day all over the internet, but the use, reuse, and recontextualization of audio feels like something that is fundamentally unique to TikTok. Images as memes are common, and with GIFs animated memes aren't unusual, but audio is rarer. YouTube videos are too long and make sharing content too onerous for audio clips to really become mimetic. 
Shmoyoho actually run a YouTube channel and posted their Stranger Things Songified video there, but unless you already follow them, you aren't likely to have heard the song on this platform, even though it's inescapable on TikTok, to the point where Jimmy Fallon had to mention it. There's this thing on uh, that I was looking at on uh, TikTok. It's, he made a remix of your, using your line, Chrissy, wake up. And and most people using Twitter or Reddit or Facebook don't want audio to start blasting out at them, so those platforms don't tend to generate audio memes either. But if you're on TikTok, you're already there to watch videos, so audio has a real chance to take root. So there's this very specific kind of shorthand on TikTok that almost echoes what YTMND used to do, where audio will be repeated with different imagery, or imagery will be run with alternate audio to convey humor or an idea or just use memetics to express oneself. And that's kind of cool. The sound selection mechanism is also just one of a number of tools designed to make content creation easier and friendlier for people. Video production is kind of hard, ask anyone who's been on YouTube for a while, but TikTok goes out of its way to ease that burden in an effort to get more content for the content gods. For example, there's the extremely common use of text-to-speech functionality. Not everyone wants to put their face or voice out into the internet, so TikTok provides users with the ability to type up their message and have it be read out in a number of different voices. It's useful for people who can't speak or wish to remain anonymous or have stage fright or don't mind speaking but are in a place where they can't easily record audio or are 12 years old but want to be taken seriously by adults. There are a lot of scenarios where a video with text-to-speech work really well. And like a lot of other video apps out there, there are a host of filters you can use to build an edifice between yourself and your audience, avoiding the sense of putting literally you out there too much. Filters can also become their own memes as a springboard for people to make content, like What Bagel Am I? or Smash or Pass Cartoon Parents Edition. And there are a number of ways that TikTok encourages users to generate content off of other people's content that are largely unique to the platform. First, there are duets, which allow you to take someone else's video and put your video next to theirs. These tend to be less confrontational and more collaborative. A musician will upload a backing track and someone else will sing a song over it. Medusa, let me introduce you, brain like book, like the main stage Lollapalooza. Or a silly scene will play out and someone else will duet what was going on just off screen to recontextualize the original video. Can we stop duetting videos when we have absolutely nothing to add to them? I don't, I don't need to know what you looked like. Why? Can we stop duetting videos when we have absolutely nothing to add to them? Duetting videos when we have absolutely nothing to add to them. Duetting videos when we have absolutely nothing. And there's an entire subgenre of TikTok jokes that involve posting a single video that others can contextualize in funny ways, like the coworkers at lunch meme. Mobs can actually still spawn on strings, so if we hook that string up to an observer and then hook that observer up to a sticky piston, we can essentially create a farm that pulls the ground out from underneath a mob as soon as it spawns. Now, sure, it's an expensive farm to make, but short of an end of light farm, you'd be hard. So seeing as the terminal velocity in D&D limits the maximum fall damage to 20d6, you could drop a raging totem of the bear barbarian from space. And if he hit the ground, he would not fall unconscious, much less die, if he had the appropriate constitution. Killing things with this sparkly crystal magic, and I'm wearing I'm wearing this dress, and it's a backless dress, and I'm looking snatched as I slay my enemies. And sometimes I hang out with these talking pots that like to garden, and I can pick the flowers in their garden. And I'm trying to get a spell that lets me shoot the literal moon at my enemies, and the person giving me the spell is kind of a baddie, and I heard that you could maybe be her side. Ultimately, the structure of duets requires users to take what's there and build on top of it, leading to it being a pretty friendly and collaborative tool. Stitches, on the other hand, tend to be much more aggressive. That's not environmentally friendly, they're just doing it so they can pretend they're reducing pollution. Because Sprite bottles are bright green, they've been notoriously very visible in landfill and pollution. You can see them all over here. Remember when YouTube briefly had the ability to make response videos before it became apparent that that sort of functionality was ripe for abuse? Yeah, that's kind of a core part of TikTok as a platform. Just found out that they beheaded Ned Stark. Damn. Spoilers, man, come on! Game of Thrones has only been out a few years at this point, not everybody's been able to watch it. When you stitch someone else's video, you can take an arbitrary five seconds of footage from that video and use it as the opening five seconds of your own. This is only really used in two ways. 
The first is saying that you agree with everything the Stitch video said and that you should totally go watch it, but that you have something to add, or picking the juiciest five seconds of someone else's video to begin yelling about how dumb and bad they are. In essence, Stitches are the quote retweet of the TikTok world. Finally, there are comment response videos that allow you to make a response video to any comment in the system, including comments not on your own videos. Oh, this is also usually pretty toxic. Imagine if YouTube had a system that allowed YouTubers to quote any comment left on anyone's videos and make a response video to it, including a link back to the original comment so that their followers could go and yell at the original commenter or make their own videos mocking the bad comment. It's not uncommon to see a video pop into your feed that is someone responding to a comment that itself was on a video that was responding to a comment that was left on a joke video three layers deep that you haven't even seen yet. The point is, TikTok is interested in making content creation as easy as possible. In some ways, that's good. The mass democratization of film is a medium for expression and communication. But in other ways, the ease of creating content serves to increase engagement metrics, videos and comments begetting comments and videos. In a lot of ways, it's a platform designed to provoke fights, as much or more than something like Twitter. And I think we need to be aware of that. So, if there's one place that TikTok being the product of a Chinese company is really, truly felt by end users, it's in their moderation policy. Where Western social media platforms like YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook tend to embrace a free speech view where they'll only intervene when either the law or immense public pressure makes them, TikTok is pretty proactive about moderation. But not in a ban the Nazis sense. TikTok embraces the same values neutral moderation philosophy as other platforms there. And I'm like, am I on white supremacy teacher TikTok? And is that a thing? Yes, it's a thing. But more in a keep the platform advertiser friendly sense. Myths abound about the algorithm shadow banning videos that use certain words, so a whole TikTok vocabulary has sprung up around sensitive topics. For example, TikTokers will use the phrase unalived instead of killed. Or in video descriptions and text-to-speech, they will use segs in place of sex. Women's thoughts watching a seg scene versus men. Cherry emojis mean boobs. Peach emojis mean butts. Cosplay videos plaster fake gun all over lest they be accused of promoting violent content. Horror-themed videos plead fake blood in a way that undercuts their spookiness. The specter of arbitrary and capricious moderation is everywhere. That's yummy. That's yummy hot dog. Yo, what up, people? Um, I'm stitching this because, well, my channel is banned. Yeah, it's banned. It got banned. I, I hit 300,000 followers that night, and now this shit's banned. I'm trying to build this one up, so please help me out. Even the platform's advocates and most popular users are aware of the problem. TikTokers are a little bit terrified of the platform because moderation is really haphazard and there's lots of stories, and I've witnessed it myself, of people just kind of losing their accounts and not being able to do anything about it and not knowing why it happened and, and, and being told why it happened and knowing that it's not a good reason and that like something there was a mistake or <laughs> like a typographical error or something and just like an account with a million followers is just gone so tiktokers are really like scared honestly the worst of this i've ever seen on tiktok and because of the nature of the app it's long gone and i'll never find it again is of a young girl maybe 17 years old she was sobbing because her video doing a then viral dance in a swimsuit had been taken down for violating the sexual exploitation of minors rule but she was doing the same dance her friends were, also dressed in swimsuits, and their videos were all still up. The only difference was that she was heavier than her friends. And it probably wasn't an accident. In 2019, a report from German site Netzpolitik uncovered documents that showed TikTok advised its own moderators to censor content from fat, LGBTQ+, or disabled individuals. They purported that this was to avoid bullying, but as we've seen, the platform is designed to make content from content, so bullying is in some ways inevitable on TikTok. And their answer wasn't to change the platform or moderate the bullies for bullying, it was to hide the content from people they think are vulnerable to that sort of exploitation. And that's the positive reading of the situation, because the real answer seems to be that they don't think some people are marketable. In 2020, The Intercept ran a piece on how moderators were told to exclude specific types of content from the For You page. From the piece, quote, 
Under this policy, TikTok moderators were explicitly told to suppress uploads from users with flaws both congenital and inevitable. Abnormal body type, ugly facial looks, dwarfism, an obvious beer belly, too many wrinkles, eye disorders, and many other low quality traits are all enough to keep uploads out of the algorithmic fire hose. Videos in which the shooting environment is shabby and dilapidated, including, but not limited to, slums, rural fields, and dilapidated housing, were also systemically hidden from new users, though rural beautiful natural scenery could be exempted, the document notes. End quote. Now, it should be noted that the most egregious of these stories are at this point a few years old. It's possible that as the platform has gained a foothold in the US, the moderation has loosened. But because of the black box nature of the algorithm and moderation policies, it's impossible to say for sure. Consequently, the only thing we can say for sure is that the censorship at play at TikTok is historically not about user safety or crafting a welcoming environment or protecting vulnerable groups of people, but crafting a cool, metropolitan, sexy, aspirational image that attracts both young, affluent users and advertisers at the cost of excluding those they don't deem part of that group. It's not great. This is going to be a brief summary of the monetization situation. For more information, see Hank Green's video on the subject where he really breaks things down with some specific numbers. But the long and short of it is that TikTok is not really great for most creators. Or more specifically, TikTok is really bad at financially compensating its creators. Because TikTok videos are usually only a few minutes long, and often much shorter than that, they can't run ads on individual TikToks the way you can run ads on a YouTube video. Like, if I get a video that has a million views and 600,000 ad impressions happen because of that, I get a cut of each of those impressions. The actual payout is complicated and obfuscated because YouTube auctions off ad space, so it's not 600,000 times a flat tenth of a cent or whatever, but my video directly generated ad revenue that YouTube offers me a cut of. I make content, they run ads on it, we both make money. Cool. But it can't work that way on TikTok. They don't pre-roll ads or run ads in the middle of videos. Instead, as you're scrolling through your timeline, every 5 to 20 or so videos, you'll get an ad video. And because internet ads generate so little revenue to begin with, and because there's no way to associate that ad impression with any particular TikTok right before or after it, TikTok creators don't get a direct cut of the ads that their videos show up next to. No one person or account earned that impression the way this video might earn an ad watch at the opening of the video. So how do they dole money out? They have a creator's fund. They take a set amount of money and set it aside and let all creators involved in the creator fund take a piece of it based on their performance. This results in a substantially smaller payout per view than what other platforms offer because you're not creating revenue the way you would be on, say, YouTube. You're just competing for your slice of a set pie. So if you do really high numbers in a given month, but other people also do really high numbers that month, your income might not really change all that much. It's payout as a percentage of attention, not payout for eyeballs earned. And in order for your income to go up, it's not enough to get more viewers, but to get more viewers faster than other creators on the platform. And the more people who join the creator fund, the smaller your slice of the pie will necessarily be. So as the platform grows and more people are eligible to make money on TikTok, the less anyone involved with the creator fund will make. Worse, it's not a very big pie we're talking about. In 2020, the creator's fund was $200 million. They've promised to grow it to over a billion dollars over the next three years, and that sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But keep in mind that YouTube gave out $15 billion with a B to creators in 2021. Now, this isn't exactly apples to apples. TikTok's business model for ad revenue is kind of terrible, and TikTok only earned $3.8 billion from ads in 2021, whereas YouTube made $28 billion from ads in 2021. But still, as a fraction of ad revenue generated, in 2021, YouTube split its ad revenue 55-45 in favor of creators. Now, I can't find the actual size of the creators fund in 2021. Part of the problem is that they allocate how much creators can earn at their discretion and don't need to release those numbers. But if we take the $200 million TikTok spent in 2020, add the $266 million it would take to get them a third closer to a billion dollars over three years, and compare it to their earnings in 2021, their split was about $466 million paid out to creators versus $3.8 billion in revenue, or 12% of ad revenue going to creators. So, no one gets rich on TikTok. They get rich by parlaying their attention and fame into other endeavors. 
which is great for influencer culture, but not so great for people looking to fund simple acts of creation, where the product is the video content itself. Twitter has a problem colloquially referred to as the main character of the day, where a person will tweet something offensive, incorrect, or just cringe, and a large portion of the site kind of loses their mind riffing on them. Like Bean Dad. You remember Bean Dad. John Roderick wouldn't feed his daughter until she figured out how to use a can opener and framed it as an act of wise, forward-thinking parenting and encouraging problem-solving. And people absolutely tore him to shreds for neglecting to feed his daughter, especially after it came out that he had said some other more flagrantly bad stuff. Well, a similar thing happens on TikTok. Someone can do or say something that causes them to go viral and, as a result, they get their 15 minutes of fame or shame. But it's a little different on TikTok. The engagement of individual people power Twitter's main character of the day, but on TikTok it's that human engagement boosted with the power of the algorithm. Because the algorithm that drives the sides of TikTok doesn't use pre-programmed categories, but dynamically invents its own as they occur. That way a breaking news story, or a holiday, or whatever, can have its side of TikTok emerge, bloom across For You pages for however long it's relevant, and then as interest wanes, recede into the background. So when a person or account goes viral on TikTok, it's not just that lots of people are making videos about them or talking about them. People making all those videos makes the algorithm take notice and eventually gives them their own side of TikTok. It begins looking to place main character of the day content in front of as many viewers as possible based on shared interests. This can explode the scope of the main character of the day. It's not just the followers of the people that have been making videos, but people who have an interest in other things those creators have done. Like Bean Dad, John Roderick, had worked with Jonathan Colton and had composed Mabim Bam's theme song. Imagine algorithmically placing all the tweets making fun of Bean Dad in front of any Colton or McElroy fans on Twitter as related content. The algorithm also makes main characters last way more than a day. Because TikTok doesn't give you a chronological feed, but gives you videos you might like over the past few days, it doesn't burn hot and fast, but becomes a sort of perpetual topic of discussion for as long as there's interest. So you get fewer main characters of the day, but when you do get them, they can go supernova. And that's probably not great. I mean, it's not necessarily bad. A lot of TikTok's greatest celebrities rose to fame in this way. Remember Noodle the Pug and waking up every day to find out if it's a Bones Day or not? I mean, if you're watching this video to learn about TikTok, probably not. But the dog got so famous, he was on the Today Show. Bella Porch's entire TikTok and music career is basically down to one hypnotic head-bobbing video going crazy viral and everyone imitating it. This is part of the appeal of TikTok and its algorithm. If you win the algorithmic lottery, it can literally make you a star overnight. Everybody is just the right 30-second video idea away from being famous. But it also means that everyone is the wrong 30-second video away from being infamous. The system doesn't just make heroes, but villains. My feed was overrun when it came out that Dinks, the Star Wars lore-explaining puppet, look, TikTok is a weird place, was actually operated by an unrepentant homophobic jerk, to the point where other puppets on the platform had to come out and denounce the situation to ensure they weren't mistaken for sharing his views. We're just here to say we don't stand for it. Yeah. It's not we, cool. Yeah, we don't claim him. Mm -mm. And uh, he's, he's all, yours now. Yeah, he's all yours now. If you ever hear me use the phrase homosexual agenda, could you just... Do me a favor, just boop, right in the back of my noggin, please. I'd appreciate it very much. The fact that all the other puppets had to do damage control because of it. This is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. None of this feels real. But while Dinks dominated my feed, he genuinely had terrible views. Other times, the algorithm isn't so discerning. There's also the recent story of Jake Novak, an aspiring comedian and musician who posted weekly comedy songs. His crime was that he was... A little theater kid cringe, I guess? He posted a music video a week to okayish numbers with songs that are, admittedly, well-produced but not particularly funny. I lost the wordle And I've never not won before I feel like a turtle I couldn't solve in six, let alone in four But then he did a video pretending to audition for SNL, which combined his cringe with a smidge of braggadocious ego that wasn't quite tongue-in-cheek enough to come off as comedic, and that combination basically exploded. The reaction was so negative, it generated its own side of TikTok, where people made memes making fun of him, the song, SNL, and more. I wanna be the next SNL cast member, and here's why I should be a contender. Hi, Lorne Michaels, I'm Jake Novak. I wanna be the next SNL cast member, and here's why I should be a contender. But the second funniest possible thing that SNL could do from here 
is make this guy a cast member. Um, but the first funniest thing that they could do is end the show altogether. I want to be the next MCU Avenger, and here's why I should be a contender. Hi, Kevin Feige. I'm Squirrel Girl. He had posted weekly for months, but as soon as the SNL video hit, he just stopped. He recently got a piece done in Vulture talking about how he received death threats and had to walk away from the internet for a while. Worse, they started tracking him down in real life, which isn't cool. Now those memes have gotten to the point where people are going to his job and bringing this up to him, going to his job to harass him over what? Him being kind of corny and passionate and zealous about his work? The internet used to be a place where you could be a weird little freak and you'd make things for other weird little freaks who were looking for that kind of content and you'd form this little weirdo community. Now, thanks to TikTok, it is so easy for content you made for one kind of audience to end up in front of the wrong one. The eye of TikTok's attention does not always feel good. What's worse is that on TikTok, you don't even have to be the actual person making the content to go viral. Take the case of West Elm Caleb, a man accused of ghosting several women in New York. He became this symbol of a number of problems with modern dating. And as more and more people shared their stories about being ghosted, or that they may have known a Caleb, or even trying to figure out which guy named Caleb at West Elm was THE West Elm Caleb, a whole side of TikTok emerged to lament his existence. Here's a bit from the great Sarah Zed video on the topic, which you should check out if you want to know more. Very quickly, you'd see accounts tracking the guy down, posting his full name, trying to get him fired, and making humorous content about him. Whether it was jokes that the guy wasn't even hot, or jokes about going outside to find him or film him in real life, or jokes commenting on and recapping his Hinge bio, or just generally weighing in on everything, people couldn't get enough of it. And of course, neither could brands. You had streaming services like Peacock TV using the opportunity as a moment to market. An upcoming dating app took his bio and took out a giant fucking billboard calling his bio a red flag in order to promote their own app as, presumably, a Caleb-free place. Tabloid websites got in on it, everyone had their own joke or take to lend to the situation, all the while you had responses ranging from mild amusement to finding and posting the full name of this man and his face across the internet for millions of people to see and demanding he be fired from his job. He became a villain of the week with his own side of TikTok, without ever posting on TikTok. The point is that TikTok's algorithm amplifies people's interests and instincts for good, but also absolutely for ill. It can build up pop superstars and comedy chefs and famous pugs, but it can also be an entire engine of harassment and anger. And yes, villains of the week don't happen without people making riffs and jokes and mean-spirited content and discourse about whether the whole scenario was even valid. The nightmare of Twitter is proof enough of that. But having an algorithm that turns that popular topic into a promoted side of TikTok that you can land on is maybe not helping the situation. Hey, I heard you like Saturday Night Live. Would you also like to engage in a harassment campaign? Okay, so you made it through 45 minutes of me rambling about TikTok. Why should we care? Well, for one, as I think I've demonstrated, there's a tremendous amount of culture and discourse happening here, and I think you ignore it at your peril. TikTok is where pop songs first skyrocket to popularity in 2022. It's where you can find anything from people creating sandwiches by rolling dice, to pop songs about cool dogs, to amazing animation projects. Stuff is happening on this platform that isn't happening anywhere else, and if you ignore it, you're simply cutting yourself out of that experience. TikTok is a place where people are expressing themselves and exploring the world. It's a place to create things that combine visuals and audio in a way that doesn't work on most social media platforms, but are too short and rough and personal for YouTube. And I love it for that. But it's also an attention engine capable of doing a lot of harm, and people are rushing to copy it without thinking about those dangers. Other platforms, platforms you already use or like, are already moving to imitate it. As referenced, Instagram is insisting it's no longer a photo sharing site and wishes to move towards being a photo and video platform, reorienting towards its Reels functionality, which is basically just TikTok. YouTube introduced YouTube Shorts, brief videos that have the same vertical 9x16 format as TikTok. Facebook intends to mix its feed up with some content from your friends and family, but with a bigger emphasis on creators contributing videos or posts to its platform. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure any of them will succeed. None of them seem interested in solving the content creation problems that TikTok has tried to address, instead expecting people to just make stuff for them because their platform exists and might have an audience. Like, TikTok content has its own style and culture because of the nature of the platform. What's Facebook content look like? 
What, minion memes shared by your aunt who's real into QAnon? Instagram's reels just feel like a poor imitation of TikTok with twice as many ads and brands. And despite being a video platform, YouTube really hasn't figured out how to blend its 9x16 shorts with its traditional long-form 16x9 content in an organic way, resulting in shorts content basically either being reposts of TikToks or highlights from a channel's mainline content. But it doesn't matter. TikTok has seen explosive growth and incredible engagement metrics. In a world where the rest of the internet's content, long-form video, pictures, short-form text posts, etc., have all calcified under one or two platforms, these companies see a moment where if they can copy TikTok, they could dethrone it and claim the huge growth and untapped earnings of this new short-form video world for themselves. A world where everyone has a movie studio in their pocket, and where anyone can be made a star with a clever gimmick or funny meme. But also a world where the algorithm delivers content, which means the platform is monetized, not the videos themselves, and so creators earn even less. A world where an anonymous algorithm, beholden to no one, can decide to promote you as the enemy of the week. A world where your content can end up attracting a leering audience that you don't want. A world where a corporation can create an artificially heteronormative, wealthy, ableist, and youthful image for its users by simply rendering the people that don't fit that image silent and invisible to everyone else. So, I think it behooves all of us to really understand what these platforms are actually chasing. Its strengths and weaknesses, its pros and cons, its potential for enabling creators and artists to do great things, and its potential for enabling exploitation and harassment at great scales.